Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I just want to say welcome to um, the workshop. Hopefully everyone is here for job search strategies for international students. Is everyone in the right place? Okay, great. All right, so let me introduce myself. My name is Lenita Sells, and I work in career services here on campus, and then I will also let my co-presenter introduce herself. Hi, my name is Amy Cockrell. I'm an international student advisor in the Office of International Student and Scholar Services. I'm sure I've seen many of you, and I'm happy to see you here this evening. Okay, so to give you guys a brief summary about what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk a little bit about elevator pitches and we'll do a brief exercise where you can practice this. Then we're also going to talk briefly about resume basics. So we won't go into great depth about your individual resumes, but we'll give you some starting points. And then we'll also tell you some locations that you can visit in case you want to meet with someone to talk a little bit more intently about your specific resume. We'll also talk about interviewing basics, talk about the job search, as well as visa and work offer authorizations okay so first things first your elevator speech how many people has heard, have heard about that I see some hands some hands are going up and there's a few people that have not heard about them and that's fine so I'm gonna pick on this young man right here in the front can you tell me what an elevator speech is Yes. Right, exactly. So that was a very good summary. So what he said was your elevator speech is basically something that you would utilize when you're introducing yourself um, to individuals. Now, the reason why we're talking about this right now, and it's a timely topic, is because Career Fair is in literally two days. Career Fair um, 2013 is on Wednesday, September 18th. And one of the big things that we will tell students to do is prepare an elevator speech, because when you're at Career Fair, that is one of the first things that you're going to do when you're introducing yourself to the employer. So one of the things that you want to think about to include include very much like this young man said is you want to make sure that you include your name your education your year your major and relevant relevant um, re related experience sorry so very much like he said if you're networking or talking with an employer you want to kind of give them something that's going to describe who you are and what you do as well as what you're looking for so if you're looking for an internship experience you want to indicate that in your elevator pitch or speech so that they know that's where you're trying to direct that conversation okay so you also can use those in networking events doesn't necessarily have to be at career fair where you can meet maybe you're meeting with an employer at an info session or maybe you're just out um, in Oxford community and you run into someone that may have similar interests to you, then you can introduce yourself that way and highlight some of your specific skills and qualities that you possess that may align with what that person has to offer. So how many of you think you know how a good elevator speech will go? Do you want to see an example? Sure? Okay. Lenita, let's, let's, let's give them an example. Okay, great. So Lenita, it's nice to meet you. I'm an employer at Procter & Gamble, and I understand you're interested in, in potentially having a career with us. You're right, Amy. Like Amy said, my name is Lenita. I'm a senior marketing major here at Miami University. Yeah. Um, I've had an opportunity to do two internships over the past two summers where I was working specifically on marketing analysis and marketing research at various corporations. Many of them were, sm the internships were smaller. Um, very much interested in continuing that exposure and I heard here that Procter & Gamble has a great research and development department, and I would love for the opportunity to work there. Okay, well, Lenita, I think that there's definitely some experiences here that could match up to what we're hoping to do as a corporation. So what do we think Lenita did well? I see some hands, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so Lenita gave her, her some basics, her basic information, who she is, what she's majored in here at Miami, and some of the experiences she's had. What else? I saw some other hands. Anyone else? Mandy? She was self-confident So confidence. Confidence can be key sometimes when you meet with someone. She shook my hand. She looked straight in my eyes, in my face, and was engaging with me on the individual level. She also did a great job in, in, in connecting her experiences, concrete experiences, to what I'm looking for as an employer at Procter & Gamble. So she talked about things like research. So she researched the employer. She knew what the employer might be looking for. Okay. Okay. So we're going to ask you guys, challenge you guys a little bit for about two-minute exercise to pair up 
with someone and practice an elevator pitch, okay? So you can pair it with the person next to you or pair it with someone behind you or in front of you. And we just wanna give each person one minute because that's about as long as you would have, 30 seconds to a minute to just practice what you think your elevator pitch would sound like, okay? And we're gonna walk around and listen in. Okay, so thank you guys for participating in the um, elevator speech activity. Question that I have for you all, how did you feel that went? Was it easy, hard? Awkward. Awkward? awkward. <laughs> was it awkward? Yes. Why was it awkward? Directly in the eye, yep. And if it's not something you're used to doing, it can be a little bit awkward. One of the tips that I would give you is practice looking at yourself in the mirror. <laughs> I know that seems weird, but that'll, that'll help you practice direct eye contact. Okay, other comments? How many of you felt like you knew exactly what to say, what you would want to tell an employer now, that you'd be ready? <laughs> How many people say yes by show of hands? Uh, one person, and so everyone else is no? Okay, so the benefit of having this workshop before career fairs, because it gives you an opportunity to know what you have to prepare. So if you know that you're going to be introducing yourself to employers, and you know that you're having a little bit of a difficulty um, figuring out exactly what you want to say and how you want to present yourself, now you know that you need to go back and practice. And you can practice your elevator pitch. Again, I would recommend practicing it in the mirror so that you can look at yourself and practice that direct eye contact, practice with your roommate, maybe practice with your friend. If you have a faculty member or a close um, staff member on campus that you're really close with and you feel comfortable with, I would say practice with them so that they can give you feedback, but you're definitely going to want to practice it so that you can get used to saying it because you don't want it to seem rehearsed, you want it to seem like it's natural and that it's just flowing because you should be that well versed in your experiences to be able to speak about them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And saying it out loud, sometimes just saying it out loud helps ingrain it in your mind. It sounds familiar, you know how you want to sound. So you don't just want to say, my name is Amy, I'm a student at Miami, I'm majoring in English, I think I want to do that. You want to sound again, confident and happy to be talking to someone and enthusiastic about the type of career or internship you're pursuing. So again, emotions and inflections matter just as much as what you're saying as well. Okay, all right. So we're gonna slide over to talk a little bit about resumes, okay? And so the first tip that we'll give you when it comes to resume, and again, this is going to be basic information about resumes, not so much specific to your majors or your fields that you're looking to. This is just basic information that any student can utilize when they're thinking about approaching resume writing. So one tip that we're going to give you is that you're going to want to have a specific objective, okay? So for individuals that are familiar with resumes, you'll know, and I'm going to jump to this really quick, is that there's four basic blocks of information included on every resume. And those four basic blocks is your name and contact information, your career slash job objective, and then your education or your experience, okay? And when it comes to that second block of information, which is your career slash job objective, you want to make sure that that is specific to every position that you are applying for. And in our resume guides, we do a very good um, we do a very good method of showing you of how you can actually target your objectives to make it specific to a position or a field or a company that you're applying for. So for those of you getting prepared for career fair, one of the things that I would tell you is if you're looking at your top five companies, take your resumes and actually create five different resumes that have an objective that's specific to the internships or the full-time jobs that you're looking for at those companies and then actually give the employer the resume that has an objective that's a seeking internship position or accounting internship position with Ernst & Young for summer 2013 where I can utilize and list your top three skills. Now when it comes to your top three skills, you want to make sure that those skills are connected to the job description that you're applying for or the internship that you're applying for and you want to also make sure that you actually possess those skills, okay? So I would not say that I want to say, I would not say that I'm going to be utilizing analytical communication and organizational skills if those are not skills that I actually possess and they cannot be seen throughout my experiences listed on my resume. Okay? Makes sense to everyone? So you want to make sure that it's specific and targeted. Yes, specialization is key. For example, when I receive resumes in my office, I work in a large field of international education. What I'm interested in is candidates who are interested in what I do specifically, which is work with international students. So while this candidate may have experience in study abroad, what I want to know is do you have experience in specifically the area that I'm looking at? So it really impresses employers when you've done your research and when you know what they are looking for, what their area specifically is. 
Okay. The other thing that we would say is tailor action verbs as needed. And also with that same, um, that same statement, I'll say start each bullet statement with a strong action verb. So each bullet statement that you put under your experiences, whether they be campus involvement, so if it's your leadership experience or your work experience or even your internship experience, should always start off with a strong action verb, like communicated, addressed tutored, mentored, analyzed, researched, created, developed. Those are examples of strong action verbs. And again, in our resume books, we have a list of action verbs that you would want to use when you are writing your resume. Now, action verbs denote or they communicate some level of skill. So you really want to make sure that you're picking the most appropriate action verb to talk about the experience that follows that bullet statement, OK? Um, the other thing is you want to provide quantities where you can. So make sure that you quantify numbers um, with percentages, dollar amounts, data. So if a student said, I managed a budget, that sounds nice, but if they can say, I managed a $5,000 budget, that gives the employer or the person reading it more context mm -hmm. as to how much work and value went into their work when they were managing that budget. So quantities definitely add value to your experiences that you have listed on your resume, okay? The other thing is you wanna highlight the most important experiences first. So although we have that block of information, contact information, career objective, your education, most of the time those three will always stay in that order, okay? Okay? Contact information, objective, education. However, when you get to your work experience, your leadership involvement, as well as maybe relevant um, accounting experience or relevant finance experience or relevant volunteer experience, those categories can be adjusted based off of what experiences are going to be most connected to your job that you're applying for or the purpose of your resume. So rule of thumb, we always tell students is that employers read from top to bottom, left to right. And so the higher you have your relevant experience, the more likely those experiences will be viewed by employers. So you may have to, when you're reviewing your resume, adjust and maybe move your volunteer experience up if you're applying for a job that's really heavy on volunteer experience and you've had significant volunteer experience that would really communicate the skill and the value that you would bring to that job or internship experience. Okay. One suggestion might be to actually create a master resume that lists mm -hmm. all of the experiences you've had, but then when you're applying to specific internships or jobs, pu pu pull from that master resume into something that's more targeted and more specialized for the position you are applying for at that company. So again, having a list of all the things you've done, but then making something that's specific to what you're applying for mm -hmm. and really customizing it. And that's something that if you meet with anyone over in career services, whether it be a career assistant or a career advisor, that's something that we recommend for students to do. We will recommend for you to have a master resume and then pull and tailor your individual resumes based off of the internships and jobs that you are applying for. So you really want to put forth that extra effort. I know you might be looking at me and like thinking like, Lenida, that is a lot of work. But you really want to put forth that um, extra effort because um, your resume is one avenue that they're going to use to get you to that interview. And if your resume does not connect you with that job or that internship, then they're not going to think that you're qualified for the position that they're, um, they're um, recruiting for. Okay? So it's important to do that extra work. So one of the questions we often get is, well, I'm an international student. What should I be putting on my resume that's related to being an international student? And one of the things we want to stress is that you are real assets to companies and organizations, OK? You have a lot to offer as an international student. Um, so we really urge that you highlight your pertinent work experience in the US as well as outside the US. So if you've had an internship at home or a great volunteer experience at home that really connects to what you are applying to do here in the US, please do include it, OK? It may be the thing that stands out to the employer that makes them want to know more about you. We also would urge you to emphasize accomplish, accomplishments, not just experience. So this goes back to giving concrete examples, what Lenida was saying. So, for example, me seeing, well, saying, well, you know, I've, I've worked with student organizations in the past. That's nice. That's very broad. That's not very specific. What did I accomplish with the student organization? What did I do with them? Well, we coordinated a major program that had X amount of attendees and resulted in X actions. This gives concretes. This gives context. And now suddenly the employer can relate to the experiences you are giving them. So again, concrete experiences, accomplishments, positive things that you have done in, in your various roles as students, as employees, as volunteers here at Miami. We would also just um, want to urge you to not include things like TOEFL scores. This is not something you need to put in your resumes. Um, we, it is assumed that you have English proficiency. You have been here as students in the US. So it's just not something you need to even consider putting in your resume. Um, 
Another question we sometimes get is, what about my status? I'm an F1 student or I'm a J1 student. Again, this is not something that needs to be in your resume. A resume is when the employer is just looking through applications and trying to find individuals that interest them, that they want to interview. So you will have an opportunity, if selected, to talk about those things later. Okay, so not at this, at this point in the job search. Um, we would also urge you to always put your U.S. contact information versus your home address in your home country because they're probably not going to call home to, to Ghana if you're from Ghana or, or from another foreign country, okay? They want to know where you are in the U.S. And, and you probably do have a U.S. address that you can provide. So again, really urge that. I would also urge using um, an email address. We don't have this here, but an email address that it's professional. So I probably, when I would, I would probably be using my Miami email address to be honest most of the time because it's fairly professional, it's your name. I probably wouldn't put my email address if it's smiley123 at hotmail.com. It's not a bad email address, but it's not necessarily projecting the professional image that I want to give to the employer. So again, think about those things a little bit, the, the things you're putting on the resume. Um, another thing we want to urge is do include your fluency in other languages. It is one of the biggest things you can bring to an employer, okay? Um, many of you obviously speak two languages, maybe you speak three, maybe you speak more, and you can indicate your various levels, fluent in this, proficient in this, beginner in this. It's okay because if you've studied other languages and you do have some experiences, please share that with the employer. A lot of companies, they're transnational, they're multinational, and they're looking for individuals who can, who can do that, who can work in various environments. And finally, do always check your spelling, your grammar, your use of language. That's just a good habit for anyone when writing a resume. Get a second opinion. Have another person look at it. Personally, I urge that you use career services. They are happy to look at your resume and review it with you, okay? It is so crucial because if you've been staring at it and you miss that one typo, guess what? I guarantee that when the employer is looking through the resumes, that typo is just going to stand out at them. So you really want to catch those things before you submit your, your resume to the employer. Another thing we want to talk about is the resume versus the CV. How many of you know what a CV is? Okay, see some hands. How many have CVs? Anyone? Okay, so yes. So CV is basically the international equivalent of the resume. It is the more common format accepted in other countries. And the reason we want to highlight that is do not submit your CV to a U.S. employer. Okay, it's a very different format and it, it won't, it's really not the accepted format in the U.S. Um, some of the big differences is that a resume tends to be extremely concise, to the point very bulleted, there's, there's no extras, versus a resume is much more detailed, provides a lot more detail about what you've done as a student, as a professional, as an individual sometimes, and your resume is not going to allow you room for that. Um, really with a resume, again, you only want to highlight relevant experience. So it goes back to having a master resume, but when you're really applying, you don't submit the master resume, you submit the focused, specialized resume, versus a CV is a more comprehensive, holistic, portrait of who you are, again, as a professional. Um, so it's really a, a very different format. Um, the resume can be kind of assertive. It's, it's the one time I always say it's okay to brag about yourself. You want to brag about yourself in a resume, so it can seem a bit assertive, maybe even a little aggressive sometimes to you when you're reading through this. I did this, I did that. But again, you want to make yourself stand out as an individual to the employer, um, versus I think the CV isn't quite so assertive, a little bit more maybe modest. Um, you really don't give a lot of personal information in a resume, so you may have your objective, you have who you are, but you're not going to really share again who you are as a, pers as a person, that I like to go do these things or, or what I'm doing in my, my downtime, how it might connect. It's really about your educational experience, your professional experiences, and any volunteer work that you may have that may connect to this position. And again, ACV, I think, provides a much more comprehensive picture of who you are as an individual. So they're very, very different. And again, what we really want to stress is that you want to, to submit resumes to U.S. employers. The other thing I want to stress is length. A CV is much lo is usually a lot longer than a resume. Your resume, how long, how long is your resume? Can I get a poll? How many have two-page resumes? How many people have three-page resumes? I see one that maybe is going up. So to be very honest with you, you should, none of you should have three-page resumes. I'm not even sure you should have a two-page resume necessarily. You really want to look at what you have on your resume. As students, as students, you really want to have it down to the bare bones of what's relevant to the position because an employer receives potentially hundreds of applications for one job. And so when they're looking through, looking through, looking through, 
And they're looking at those first couple things, and they may even reject you if they see that you have a resume that just goes on and on and on and on. They want to know what you bring to this specific position. So again, working with career services to make sure your resume really addresses that, is specific like that, matches the context of the application and the job is really crucial, okay? Um, so sometimes it is possible to have too long of a resume, okay? <laughs> Now, what we're going to talk about is, oh, and then I add a caveat to Amy. The only acceptable way that you could probably have a two-page resume is if you are um, a master's student. Mm -hmm. So there is a rule, um, one page per degree. So if you have your undergraduate and your graduate degree, then it would be acceptable for, acceptable for you to have two-page resume. Also, there are some instances, for example, teacher education majors, as well as um, k and majors. Even now, students that might be um, in the SLAM major, they can also have some longer resumes, but you are going to want to stick with that one-page resume. So moving on to interviewing and tips, we're going to talk really briefly about that. So when you're in the process of preparing for an interview, one of the big things that you're going to want to do is research, okay? And the research is going to come from two, very, from two angles, researching about yourself as well as researching about the company. So the next one line says, know your story. In order for you to be successful in an interview, you have got to know your story. So so you need to know about your experiences, you need to understand your majors, your minors, how they all connect, you need to be able to articulate your experiences, be able to bring in concrete examples from your experiences, whether they be from your internships, whether they be from practical in class experience, volunteer experience, but you need to know your story. So you really need to get a strong sense of all of who you are and how you can, what values and skills and abilities you have and how you're bringing those to the table. Because you need to be able to articulate this to the employer and, co and connect the dots for them, okay? So reflection is gonna be something that you will hear us talk about commonly. You'll definitely need to take that time to reflect on your experience. So if you are a resident assistant, you're gonna to wanna to think a little bit beyond just the task and the responsibility that you were given in that job. You're gonna to wanna to think a little bit about what did I accomplish there? What are there examples that I can pull from when I'm answering these interview questions that we give them concrete examples of when I dealt with a difficult client or a difficult student or how I worked on a team or how I um, perform certain tasks and responsibilities to organize and plan an event. So those are definitely things that you're going to want to think about when knowing your story. And I want to interject now and say you can be doing this now even if you weren't interviewing for an employer. This is something I do still as a professional now and I do have a job but I there's certain scenarios that every employer is always going to be interested or organizations that you're applying to so you can say wow that was a really tough situation I just dealt with. This would make a great example later if I'm asked about this type of question or wow I just did a great team activity this is a perfect example to share with such and such organization so it's something you can be doing during your entire four or six or however many years at Miami it's not something you have to wait till senior year to be working on mm -hmm. you can be doing it now and so we kind of alluded to it, and Amy did a nice segue into behavioral interviewing. And one big thing about behavioral interview is they'll be asking you to tell them about times where you performed certain tasks. So example would be, tell me about a time where you had to work with a difficult client. Now one of the things that you would want to think about is, you may think to yourself, like, I have had no experience ever working with a client or a customer. So you would want to translate that to a relevant experience to you. So that might be, tell me about a time where you worked with a difficult classmate, or tell me about a time where you worked with a difficult faculty member or tell me about a time when you worked with a difficult volunteer um, so that that is now relevant to the that particular question that they're asking you and when you're answering that question you actually want to use what we call the car method and that stands for contacts actions taken and results and you want to take the time and actually talk about the context of that situation you don't want to make it too lengthy but you want to give them a little bit of background about what happened in regards to that situation then you want to go into the actions taken now the actions taken part is really important because this is when you're really going to, again, highlight how you handled this situation. So even if it was a team effort, you want to focus on what did you do? What were your exact actions in that particular situation? Um, when you were handling it, okay? And then you want to talk about the results. Did it end positively? Was, um, that was a client satisfied? Were you able to come to some form of agreement how, how you were going to move forward? Was the, was the project received well by your faculty member? Whatever the results is, you want to include that at the end so that they know how the situation ended.
okay? The other thing is when you're preparing for interviewing, you wanna have questions for the interviewer. So researching the company is where you can develop a lot of those questions. Another way is we do have an interviewing guide that has like typical questions that you can ask interviewers, but I would also challenge you to think beyond those typical questions. So when you're researching the company, think about what you specifically wanna know about it. So if you're really concerned about working at a company with a specific work environment, then ask them questions that's going to get them talking about the work environment that you'll be working at. So if you wanna know like, am I gonna be working in small cubicles? Is this a lot of teamwork? Is this a lot of um, solo work? Ask them questions that's gonna give you a little bit more insight so that you can make an informed decision. When you interview, one of the tips that you need to remember is they're not just interviewing you, you are interviewing them as well. So you are trying to find or to determine whether or not this is a good fit for you. So you wanna ask questions and they expect for you to ask questions. So you definitely wanna come prepared with some questions for um, the interviewers, okay? The other thing about interviewing tips that um, will also highlight that you may experience as an international student, there may be some unique challenges, so there will be some differences in cultural attitudes and behaviors that you may have to also navigate. The language um, fluency might also be an issue. One of the things that I will recommend to international students that I work with is as hard as you can, try to engage in conversation with your English speaking um, classmates, roommates, um, and all, you know, roommates, friends, so that you can really start to develop a knowledge of the English language if that's an area that you are struggling in. Because the more you are able to speak the English language, the easier it's gonna be able for, for you to be able to communicate to these um, English speaking employers your skills and your values. Okay, the other things is contextualizing relevant aspects of background at home that may be unfamiliar to um, the employer. So like Amy said, you all are bringing in a, a very diverse level of experiences. Do not negate that or diminish that when you are talking to the employer. But what you wanna challenge yourself to do is you wanna think about how did that experience that I may have had in my home country now relevant to what I'm applying for. So this again goes back to that reflection piece that needs to come in, reflecting about how can I pull out specific examples from those those experience that will then make it irrelevant to the employers. The other thing is immigration status. This is a very common question that we get. Uncertainty about when or how to present the status to the employer. That's a, a question that we get oftentimes. And so many things that we'll tell them is that's not something that you automatically have to bring up. So it's not something that you have to go into the interview and be prepared to say, I'm legally able to work in the um, United States. That's something that you can wait until they ask you that question if you don't feel comfortable presenting it yourself. And then you can state that fact that I'm, I am able, legally able to, um, eligible to work in the United States. And that's kind of how you would want to phrase it, right, Amy? Yes, usually the question's phrased is, are you eligible to work in the U.S.? Legally, they can only ask you so much about, mm -hmm. about this, okay? So usually how they'll phrase it is, are you eligible to work in the U.S.? Should you receive this position or should you accept this position? And usually I would urge you to say, I am eligible to apply for work authorization, okay? Um, because usually you are, provided that, again, this position is related to your major field of study. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a, in a few more slides. So one of the things we also want to talk about, and we've actually touched on this a little bit with the elevator, elevator interview, is just communication and how communication is a very cultural a product of a culture and it varies culture to culture. So one of you remarked about how the direct eye contact felt a little bit awkward. And that, that is very true. It, you know, you're just staring at them like very, very focused, and that may feel a little strange, but it's something that's actually quite essential to be doing at an interview um, in the U.S. because it, it shows that you're engaged in what they're saying, that you're interested in what they're saying. If you were not making direct eye contact, they could either think, they could think a couple of things. In the U.S., they could say, oh, maybe they're shy. They're not looking at me. It could also be just that they feel like you're not that interested. You know, if you're staring off, just not listening to what I'm saying, you're not really interested in, in me and what I am telling you. So it's really crucial, again, direct eye contact when interviewing or when at an elevator speech at career fair, anytime you're engaging one-on-one -on -one with an employer. Um, also the firm handshake. This is always funny because people say, well, what if it's too firm? What if it's not firm enough? So what does that mean? Lenida, let's show a not very good handshake. Yeah. <laughs> So it's very, very loose, right? Very loose. So what does that convey to the employer? Does it convey anything, do you think? If someone shook your hand like that, what would you, what would you think of them? Does anyone? Chaotic. Sorry? Chaotic. Chaotic, okay. Anyone else? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I saw another hand. Not serious. Not serious, okay. Now what if I go up to Lenida and I say, 
I'm so happy to meet you. It's so great to meet you. <laughs> so what do you think about that? What does that convey? <laughs> okay, so pain, it conveyed pain a little bit, potentially, if I was squeezing her hand too hard. So a handshake can actually, what you want it to convey is confidence, again, that you're connection, connecting with the employer one-on-one. -on -one. So it seems a little silly, but again, it might be something you, you might want to practice potentially sometimes, and just making sure you're not squeezing their hand off, but you're also not just kind of very loose, just a confident, easy handshake, okay? Because it does, it does matter, it would be notable to them if it's not that way. Um, another thing is just that proactive role in the interview. One of the things that can happen sometimes is you go to the interview and they're asking you questions and you, you answer the questions but you don't maybe engage back with them. So it goes back to what Lenida was talking about is pre being prepared to ask questions, maybe reacting to what they're saying, okay? So be, be there, be present at that interview, okay? So when they say something and you think it's funny, you know, it's okay maybe to laugh. Maybe it was showing that you have a sense of humor. If they, if they say something and you want to know more about what they're saying, it might be okay to ask a question saying, well, you just remarked on how um, flood research in this company connects to how the Mississippi River is doing these things. I'm really interested in this. Could you talk about more? You know, it shows that you're listening to what they're saying, okay? So an interview is not necessarily a passive experience where you just sit in a chair and you feel like you're getting, we use the word in the U.S., grilled. So basically someone is just coming at you with questions and you don't get a chance to respond back. It really is a conversation, okay? And you should treat it that way. Um, also just the value of being able to articulate answers quickly. This is one of the things I feel like can be very tough for anyone, for, for our students and for anyone. Um, so someone asks you a question and you're thinking, oh no, oh no, I don't have an answer to that. Oh no, oh no, what am I going to say? This goes back to again the practicing and what Lenida was talking about is being prepared for some of the questions you're going to get. There are certain behavioral questions that almost every interviewer is going to ask or potentially will ask. If you go to career services, they'll have a list of those questions. Prepare in advance. I cannot begin to stress that enough. What you can do is literally take those questions and go through and identify experiences that connect to that. So study for the, you know, the interview like you would study for a test at Miami, okay? Again, I, I actually did this. This is exactly what I did. I took a, a series of 100 questions when I was a student, and I went through and tried to identify experiences that I felt would connect it to those questions. And guess what? I was definitely asked some of those questions. And because I had prepared, I didn't have that stumbling moment where I thought, oh, no, I don't know what to say. I'd already thought about this. So it was easy for me to continue with the interview and not get stuck. Another thing, though, I would urge you to consider using if you do get worried or just don't know how to answer it, if it's just something you did not prepare for, it's okay to ask clarifying questions. It's okay to, to take a moment to pause. So don't feel so on the spot that you can't take that moment. I think the difference is having long pauses where nothing is being said. So sometimes you can rephrase the question. So what you're asking is how this connects to this. Well, what I think is, so sometimes that can give you that second, just a couple seconds to really to think about it. Or if you're not sure if you understood the question correctly, it's okay to ask. I think it's better to answer the question properly than kind of make up something that, because you just didn't even know what was being asked, all right? But again, practicing is really the best way to ensure that you're feeling prepared, feeling confident and comfortable in the interview. So again, that long periods of silence, I talked about that. That will be notable to an employer in an interview if you just kind of sit there and don't answer the question or don't address it. And it it seems so easy, but again, an interview can be, it's difficult, okay? It doesn't feel natural, and the only way it's going to feel natural is if you do practice with someone, with someone in career services, with your roommate, with your best friend, with yourself in the mirror, whatever you have to do, okay? I once had a student tell me, and this worked for them, is they actually recorded themselves answering questions, and then they listened to themselves to hear how they sounded, how natural they sounded, what, what it looked like, and that's how they learned. So there's lots of options to practice this in advance. It's okay to, to be working on this now. You don't have to wait till the day of the interview to suddenly um, feel on the spot. So again, we want to talk about marketing yourself as an international student in U.S. culture. Um, if there's one thing that my students have repeatedly told me, it's that in the U.S. we are very um, focused on the individual. That is just one of the cultural products of the U.S. So very much when you're interviewing, on if you're going you're gonna to talk about your individual experience, your individual um, accomplishments. You're not necessarily going to talk about um, what your peers at Miami have done. It's really about you, and it can feel a little uncomfortable sometimes to be potentially focusing so much on yourself, especially when you know other people have contributed to your success. Um, 
again, though, you do want to, in this case, with an interview and with your resume, you do want to take credit for what you have accomplished here at Miami and in your life and in, in the experiences you've had. You do want to show how you have solved problems or made this project happen or helped with this presentation. You want to show what you have done as an individual. It's not to say that you don't respect the others who have helped you, but it's really important to, to take credit at this time. You really can't rely just on your academic and professional experience alone. So this is key. Again, employers receive lots and lots of resumes. And if this resume and that resume both says this person has a bachelor's in finance and they both had internships at there, what's going to make them pick one resume over the other? It's going to be you, who you are as an individual. So this is what you bring to the puzzle that no one else can bring. So figuring out why you are the best candidate for this position. So when you're going to a career fair and you're talking to them, so if everyone in this room says, well, I'm, I'm so-and-so and I'm majoring in such-and-such and I want to work in this, that's a good elevator speech. It's a great start. But what is something that you can say that maybe no one else can say in this room? Or, or very few people at least, okay? What is it that you can bring to this company that no one else can? Intrigue them, okay? Pull them in, draw them in with your answers, with, with who you are as an individual, all right? They'll be interested. All right, so selling yourself as an international student. We talked about how you're multilingual. You have a global perspective. This is really crucial. So you have lived in multiple countries. You understand other ways of life, all right? And that may seem so obvious to, to you, but trust me, there are people who don't, okay? Because they haven't had that opportunity to go to other places. So you can really bring in uh, and, and a dynamic to a conversation that someone else can't. Again, if you're talking about, say, a project the company's working on, and maybe that has happened in your home country, what that meant, what that is, you can bring that into the conversation. So really stressing your global perspective on things is a great way to show your resource as an international student. Intercultural competency, the ability to interact with people from diverse backgrounds, crucial in the employer working environment, okay? That flexibility, that adaptability, all employers want that. Resourcefulness, so I want to bring this up. You have been so resourceful coming to a foreign country for many of you as 18 year olds on your own for the first time. And you have come to probably a completely foreign place. I doubt many of you had been to Ohio, Ohio first. And you did all of this on your own, okay? We may have picked you up from the airport, but after that, you, you know, we're certainly here at Miami, but you've done so much on your own as individuals, as adults, and, and it's really admirable. So I think you can really show as an international student how resourceful you've been, had to be as adults, as students really taking, taking a lot of autonomy, okay, from a young age. Um, determined, again, I want to stress that you clearly are determined by taking all of these steps to get the degree that you want, okay? You've gone above and beyond to, to achieve your goals and to achieve your accomplishments. And finally, willingness to relocate. This sound, it seems so simple, but it's, it's kind of crucial because a lot of students, when they're doing, structuring their job search, they want to stay in a specific region, okay? Be it because of family, be it because of, you know, other, lo other ties to an area you can be flexible as an international student. I'm not saying that you want to go live in, um, you know, in Iowa City, Iowa. I'm not saying it's your top 10 spot, but you have the ability to do it, okay? It, it, and it may be, and maybe the willingness, if you want a job enough, to, to try to take that chance, okay? So again, I want to urge your flexibility and relocating can be really appealing to employers, all right? Um, because some US students will not, will not do that. So what I'm going to jump to now is work authorization. This is one of the most, this is the big question that I get, and this is really where I want to stress that the Office of International Student and Scholar Services is your resource. Please come to us if you have questions about work authorization. So people ask, how can I work? I'm an international student. Can't I work in the US? And the answer is yes, with work authorization. At present, none of you probably have that, OK? Other than on campus, you do not have the ability to work off campus. So what happens if you go to career fair this week and you get a tremendous opportunity next summer to do an internship in New York City with such and such firm? Well, the answer is you apply for work authorization with our office. And specifically, what you'd apply for is called CPT, or Curricular Practical Training. Okay, so that word practical training, that's key, okay, with our work authorization. It has to be directly related to your major, okay? That is the only way you can see, receive work authorization. So I really urge you, when structuring your job search or your internship, you really need to look at things connected to what you are studying at Miami. And I want to stress your major, okay? You cannot get work authorization for your minor or your concentration. It has to be connected to the major that you have here at Miami. Um, 
So to pursue the CPT authorization, you actually have to be enrolled in a course for academic credit. We would help you with that, okay? Not a big, don't let that be an obstacle or barrier. We would help you with that. There's no fee for CPT, so that is nice. And it's actually just processed by my office, International Student and Scholar Services. So that means we process it relatively quickly, okay? A week or two weeks. Um, so you would actually just come to us. We would give you the application material. So usually it's an application form. We would want to see the offer letter from the employer. Um, we would need some support from your, your department, from your academic division, and we'd help you get that and then you enroll in the class and we can give you the authorization. The most common time for students to have CPT tends to be summer because that's when you have the flexibility to potentially be doing these internships, okay? Um, it's a little bit more difficult during the semester, not impossible, but you are required to be enrolled full time at Miami in fall and spring. So generally internships would have to be in this geographic area. But in summer you have the flexibility to go other places and this authorization can be for anywhere in the US. Um, now, CPT is really for students who have not earned their degree. So what happens if you're about to earn your degree? What, what's your option? And that is called OPT, Optional Practical Training. So again, you hear that word, practical training. So this is, is for students who are just finishing their degree, okay? So actually, if you're finishing here in fall, now's a good time to begin thinking about OPT now because you could actually apply now. Um, it, again, is for work that's related to your major field of study. So again, I want to stress that when you're looking for jobs or looking for internships, don't look for things that are not related to your major. They're not options. We can't give you authorization for that. The U.S. government doesn't let us. But if you, do, if you are interested in working in the U.S. after graduation, you can apply for OPT. Um, there is an application fee of $380. That is the government charge for it. It's not for us. It's not Miami University's charge. When you apply for OPT, you're actually applying to the government versus our office, and they do require this application fee of $380. You can actually apply up to 90 days before your graduation or completion of studies. So again, if you're finishing in December, as of this week, you could be applying, okay? And it's not necessarily too early. It would be all right. Um, it's processed by the government, specifically by USCIS, and it takes a long time, two to three months. I usually tell students, plan for three months and be happy if it's less time. They are not fast, the government. Um, one of the key things to know about OPT is you cannot begin working until you actually have the authorization. So it's not just the act of applying. You really do have to wait to receive the authorization, and that's why planning ahead in your timeline and when applying is very crucial. So if you're finishing here in spring, I would say you should be thinking about OPT as early as February, okay? Which may feel very early to you, but because it takes so much time to get it, you really want to be thinking about when you want to apply early rather than at the end when you're like, oh no, I have a job, now I want authorization, but I may have to wait two to three months to get it, okay? Um, you cannot accrue more than 90 days of unemployment while on OPT. So that's one of the big things that really is stressful for, for a lot of students. And that's why, again, the application and the timing of it can be very crucial. Um, now, the days of unemployment do not begin until you have the authorization. So it wouldn't start from applying now. So if you're finishing here in December and you apply with me tomorrow, your days of unemployment don't start yet. That clock does not start until your OPT actually begins, which will be after you finish your studies, okay? Um, but it is something we can talk about more in my office or at the OPT information session. Now, OPT can actually be extended. One of the questions we get is, well, how long is OPT? Typically, it's 12 months, so one year. But if you are majoring in a STEM field, which is science, technology, engineering, or math, you may be eligible for an additional 17-month extension. So that's a big thing to know about. If you think your major falls in one of those areas, please be talking to us. We're happy to verify that for you because that could make you more, more interesting to the employer, okay? So they wouldn't get you just for a year. They could get you for another 17 months on top of that. That's a long period of time. Um, there is no cost or paperwork for the employer when filing for OPT, okay? So there's nothing the employer has to do, all right? Nothing. You don't even have to have an offer to apply for OPT. So that can be appealing to employers. Um, OPT is often used as a bridge to other statuses. So I, and I'll go into that in just a moment. One thing I want to stress is if you're interested in applying for OPT, please come to one of our information sessions like the one next week. We do it on a monthly basis. And please, please visit our website. We have a very good website on OPT because it is a complicated process, all right? And if you have further questions, do not hesitate to make appointments with us. We're happy to help you. So the question we get is, OPT is only 12 months. What do I do after that? Well, really this goes into the issue of sponsorship, which you may have heard about. Um, 
employers have to sponsor, usually the most common type is called H-1B. So often an employer might use OPT as a bridge to another status. H-1B is a working visa, all right? It's something that you cannot apply for on your own. Your employer must sponsor you. Um, H-1B's timing is tricky. Um, the fiscal year usually begins October 1st, so that means that applicants, um, employers actually helped, helped their, their individuals, their employees file for this back April 1st. And the H, if it's approved, is actually not still going to begin till October. So again, that's why OPT can be a helpful in-between status, because the timing of that is so tricky. Um, there's a limited number of H's available, so you may have heard about that, heard about lotteries, heard about people getting rejected. It's why, again, people, if employers are going to sponsor you, they're really going to try to hit that April 1st date, OK? Um, I will say that not everyone is subject to that April 1st deadline date or the cap. If you are working, for example, for a university, you are likely not subject. But most corporations, um, I'll use the Ernst & Young example, they would definitely be subject to, to, the, to the cap and to the, to the various states, okay? So you'll see employers interested in certain timelines. We really don't do a lot of H-1B advising in our office because we do not sponsor H's. We don't file for them in our specific office. But we're happy to talk about broad general outlines about it. But it's really something that should you get an offer of employment later to talk about with the employer, okay? Because they're the ones who would file it. They have a lawyer who will have very specific ways that they want to pursue that. Um, H's are usually granted for three years and then renewable for another three. So usually the next step after that is permanent residency or what's known as a green card, okay? Um, but again, I, I want to urge you that if you have questions about work authorization um, and specifically about CPT or OBT in particular, we can help you with these things. So as you're looking for jobs and as you're wondering what to say to employers about that, or if you get an opportunity, please come talk to us. We're ha happy to guide you through the application process. The other thing that I want to talk about is we do have two other additional fairs. We'll have Spring Ice that will be in February. It is actually February 4th this year, um, and it'll probably be from approximately 2 to 6. And then we also have our Teacher Job Fair web, um, fair that will be in March. Now, the other thing that I want to keep you, um, keep you guys mindful of is our webpage is the best place for you to get the most updated information about fairs and opportunities that we have, because we do have like virtual work, um, virtual fairs, and we will have other fairs for like architecture and art majors, so keep an eye on our website to get the most updated information as to when those fairs will be offered. Um, additionally, we will be having basic interviewing workshop that will be following this directly starting at 7 o'clock, so in a half hour here. Um, and then we have some resources. So after this um, workshop, tomorrow morning you'll receive an email from CareerLink. You're not going to want to delete it, and it's going to give you um, a copy of this PowerPoint, as well as it'll have two other attachments, okay? One of the attachments will be a list called Website Resources for International Students, and it'll give you a lot of additional website resources that you can utilize to help with your job search process process, as well as um, it, it'll have a list of historically known companies that will sponsor H-1 visas. So I want to emphasize that it's, they're historically known to have sponsored H-1 visas. It does not necessarily mean that they are still sponsoring them, but in the past they have, okay? The other resource that we want to bring to your attention, um, and I'm going to exit out of here really quick and pull up the web page. It's something called Going Global. So this is, can be accessed through our webpage. It has a variety of resources that are available for international students as well as domestic students that are interested in getting um, jobs internationally. So if you really, if you um, access the country guides up here at the top, they will be a great resource for you. Um, to click on, as well as if you access the U.S. Canada City Guides, because these guides will actually give you an opportunity to look at our different cities and states. You can click on the city or state that you might be interested in, and they will have a lot of other resources. Um, they typically will have a listing of top companies, so they will give you a listing of H-1B visa companies in their, lo their area, okay? So this will also be another great resource for you when you're looking for a job search. And this, again, can be accessed through our website on Career, um, Career Services website off of the Miami webpage. Okay? Lastly, I'm just going to show you our contact information. Um, as Amy said, um, she works in the, inter, um, the Office of International Students and Scholar Services, and I work in the Office of Career Services. If you want to get in contact with us, our information will be on the presentation slide that I will send to you, okay? And so that will be all of our information. And as well, like I said, I will also send you a copy of um, historically known to have sponsored H-1 visas that will be attending career fair, as well as websites for additional resources for international students, okay? And
And we want to thank you so much for being here. I do want to stress what Lenida said, which is that unfortunately as an international student, you will encounter employers who are not willing to hire international students, specifically because they won't sponsor. And I understand that's very discouraging. And I just want to urge you to persist. Every year I have students who do find careers or jobs or great experiences that are going to help them when they return home. So, so keep keep trying it, it can work out and really using the resources Lenida Lenida talked about which is these websites that give you great research um, the list of employers that she's going to give you that historically have potentially hired international do your research and, and you can really do a targeted search that will hopefully find employers that are, are internationally friendly